The smell that hits you as you walk through the front door is the same as it always has been. Polish and the heat from the tiles when the sun hits them. And it, it hasn't changed a bit. It smelled exactly the same when I walked in this morning than it did every day of my school life. It all came back to me in the lab when the Bunsen burners came out and mm -hmm. the rubber tubing and, and it all sort of starts flooding back and you start to remember things. I've always wondered since I left school why on earth anybody designed a school with a flat roof because I can remember sitting in history lessons and if you were under one of the skylights you were the one with the bucket on the table. <laughs> I mean the rainfall being what it is in the Manchester area it seems totally impractical. Jeanette Wilkinson is now a nursing sister in Newcastle. David Lewis is an international athlete. They were both at school in Haslingdon in the 1970s, the decade of greatest change for education in the town. State schools throughout the country were going, or had already gone, comprehensive. 1975 was the target year for Haslingdon. Meanwhile, the town itself was changing. I think there was some resentment um, when we saw our hills being eaten up by the new estates, I mean, over what's called Boys Home, um, I remember as a child it was all green and we used to go sledging and then the house, housing estates started creeping up, first one row and then another. And I think there was some, not so much class, but the new ones as opposed to the old, old families who'd been there donkey's years. I think that was a resentment. As the 70s began, children in Haslingdon were still taking the 11+. plus. As a result, David Lewis went to the secondary modern with Linda Monaghan. Judith Kirby, John Simpson and Jeanette Wilkinson were destined for the grammar. The usual rumours flew around beforehand as to what colour envelope you got, whether you passed or failed. If it was a thick one, you'd passed, because it gave you all the details about uniform and things. And I remember seeing a thick envelope coming through the door and thinking, oh, I must have passed. And I had. Then the next most vivid memory is my dad presented me with a Parker pen for use at the new grammar school. <laughs> you can feel the pressure from your parents about that time. You know, you know they want you to pass so much that you're almost, you're frightened of failing for them, not so much for yourself. I could always remember when I did fail it. I'm sure the teacher told me that I was on one of the the highest failures, if you know what I mean, like I was the nearest to getting passed. I um, was told that, yeah. And I, I always used to uh, tell everybody, well, you know, I nearly passed. I wasn't far from it. And I always compensated myself by saying that. After we checked in 11 plus, you, you see people who had gone to the secondary modern and they'd, you know, they'd, they'd turn against you completely we call grammar school snobs and all this sort of thing. They think how, how well you used to get on at primary school. And then suddenly it was so you were a completely different person because you'd gone to a different school. My first day, the first time I wore my uniform, I was walking confidently to the bus stop and I was called a grammar school snob and that brought me right back down to earth. I almost shamed, that's the first time I shamed for wearing the uniform. days terrifying you tend to cling to friends what you've had in the past like I came from from the uh, junior school in Haslingdon and I had maybe four or five friends there who went to the school with me and you tend to cling to those friends all the boys all the surnames seemed to begin with W there were Waddingtons and Whittakers and Warburton <laughs> and I remember thinking how, how, how am I ever going to distinguish which is which the, the old, all these unfamiliar faces and names mm. but it, you soon get used to it of course, it was all surnames then. I seem to remember everybody looked very, very smart. And I think everybody was proud to wear a uniform. Everybody, a mass of black, blue and white. That's something today when we first came in, I suddenly thought nobody's wearing uniform. But they are, but it's a very much more relaxed form of uniform. 
and you had to have your tie and it had to be neatly fastened. Everything was just so. Well, I had a beautiful, smart pair of black shoes, but they just had one red stripe across the bottom and I remember Miss Waring asking very politely if I could find some black insulation tape or masking tape and cover the strike when I came to school. <laughs> that was how strict it was. You did feel a pride in wearing the uniform on your first day, especially knowing that everybody was wearing that uniform. The more you could belong or be the same as everybody else, with it being a new school, it gave you instantly something to belong to. trying to find somebody who could be my friend because I hadn't lived in Hasenden very long because I lived abroad I felt very different and I felt very different I really wanted to mix in because I hadn't been brought up here and I felt so out of place and I didn't want to and I really didn't want to I wanted to be a local and I wanted to be accepted and my parents in my mind at that time didn't help because we had an American car, and we lived on a housing estate which they used to call, quote, Jam Butty Estate. Your houses were so expensive, you could, you could only afford to eat Jam Butties. I can always remember asking my parents to drop me off at school, a long way before the gates, just not so anybody could see the car. I really wanted to be just like everybody else. So the uniform was a bigger attraction for me. It was mainly the tease and it really got to you sometimes. But eventually you just stop and think, well, if they think I'm different, I'm going to be different. And you start getting tough. And you start saying, right, I'm better than you. And look down on people. My first day of school I had to arrive on crutches. So I had to hobble into the back of assembly on crutches with a satchel round my neck. And it was awful. Because initially everybody, of course, wanted to help. And, you know, but he said, don't worry, there'll always be someone to carry your satchel. And I remember, oh, after about a couple of months, the friend that I'd brought with me from primary school, I asked her, as I usually did, could you just manage my satchel while I hobble upstairs? And she said no. I went off with a new friend and I was heartbroken. <laughs> First thing we used to catch up with the homework we were supposed to do the night before and say, you know, we used to say, like, if I was good at English, somebody would be coming over for my English and then I'd be going to there for their maths. I can remember when my form was the biology lab, most of the girls spent the first few minutes before school blow-drying their hair in front of the large heaters at the back of the class. I used to leave, leave home, with my blazer all smart for school, and in my bag I used to have my Wrangler jacket. It was quite the thing to do at school to wear a Wrangler. We used to get within 50 yards of my house, the blazer would go in the bag, and out would come the Wrangler. Get within 50 yards of school, and the roles would be reversed again. On would go the blazer, the Wrangler in the bag. On the way home, it used to be the same as well. <laughs> Once or twice, it was confiscated at school. <laughs> We uh, went on one of the Mediterranean cruises and everybody was really into, I think they were like short Oxford bags, but they were tartan ones, white ones, always had to be white trousers, three quarter, very baggy, with a tartan trim all over the place. There were short sleeve shirts with pockets and epaulettes on the shoulder, all with tartan trim. And you always had all had these like sort of Les McEwen haircuts, spiky, and then going long at the back. It's absolutely disgusting now. If I ever saw anybody with that haircut, I'd just call them outsiders. But you had to be just like what your idols were.
Oh, yeah. City Rollers, yeah. Pop stars like Mark Ball and uh, Rod Stewart. Gordon Banks, believe it or not, was a big hero. I had all the Apollo mission stickers. I must have been probably free with cornflakes or something. But I, had, <laughs> I had those all right. And smileys. Smileys were just oh, coming yes. in at that um, stage. All the little smiling faces. And the latest heroes in school. All, all the six formers who were getting popular at that time. And yeah. the girls, especially like third form girls, seemed to attract mm. the attention of the sixth form boys. Mm. And any third form girl who was going out with a sixth form was really it. <laughs> Some marvellous discos. I remember one where all the, the six formers, who were our heroes, and that I mentioned, they all dressed up as pop idols. So we had one lot was Slade, and we had a David Bowie, and and they went the full hog with the clothes and makeup, and oh, a Gary Glitter with a, a chest wig. It was a fabulous disco. <laughs> Christmas ball was the highlight of the year. I remember my first Christmas ball. I had a floor-length black velvet dress. It's beautiful. I, and now I'd only be 11 or 12. And it's a fabulous grown-up dress. And everyone wore long dresses. Do you remember lining up at opposite sides of the hall and then having to wait until somebody picked you out? Yeah. They always, the boys always made a beeline for the, whoever was the, the heroine of the class. And then they kind of thought, oh, well, I'll take you if I, haven't, I can't get her. Oh, I used to <laughs> and the embarrassment of having to have a partner to go up to supper. You either found someone to walk out with or, or you starved. You had to pair off by supper time, otherwise you couldn't eat. That would have been 1973-74. For a few weeks before the Christmas party, PE would be abandoned and we'd go into the hall and learn how to dance the litre and, and the waltz <laughs> and do the teddy bear's pit and things like that. <laughs> Even before we went comprehensive, it had graduated more towards the disco style. So it was the girls dancing around the handbags in the disco. So that um, was even more intimidating for the boys, I think, because they then had to break up a gang of girls rather than just pick one off of the wall. <laughs> there were definite barriers when these two schools merged. And it was always a sort of grammar school, and then obviously it was us and them, if you like. Only for a couple of years, and then people started to integrate and conform. You hear all these stories before we actually moved to the comprehensive about, oh, you know, these grammar people and all this. But at the end of the day, I think everybody was just glad to go to a nice, bright new school, especially from our point of view, from the secondary. I remember feeling very lost. In, that, in my, it was my upper sixth year. I remember suddenly thinking, I don't even know the teachers' names, never mind the pupils. Um, and my biggest disappointment was, although I did get to be a prefect, there wasn't quite the same honour because everybody had to be a prefect because of the sheer numbers to be supervised, etc. But as prefects, we we only prefected the the second and the the third years. But we didn't um, mix very much with the fourth and fifth years because it was feared that there might be some confrontations occurring. Nobody knew how the mix would work initially, so it was better to avoid trouble than be left with um, prefects being challenged by fourth and fifth years. We soon adapted because we were all thrown in together. And it, it was nice having a new, a new set of faces. There was no, no animosity, it was all just new for us all. Had I stayed at the secondary school, I probably would have left school at 16 and um, been sort of an apprentice, electrician, an apprentice, carpenter, or, some, or, or something like that. I probably would have gone into some trade. It's doubtful whether I, I would have gone into a sixth form. But I think coming to the comprehensive school, I was able to aim a little bit higher. I always wanted to go into the sixth form. I wanted to pass A levels because obviously that would progress to university. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
David Lewis did go to university, and he now runs for England. I think from an early age it was obvious I had potential. If you were good at any particular sport in the school, I mean whether it be cross country running, football, basketball, swimming, you were encouraged, and that's one of the reasons why I think we've got such a good tradition here at the school in sport and excellence. Even though it was obvious I was going to be a good runner, I still wanted to play football to prove myself in a sort of team game to be with my mates playing football, playing for the school. Does anybody remember the staff school football games? Because I always remember Mr. Worrell and his shorts. He used to wear these enormously baggy shorts that came down to his knees, and he always used to be fouling everybody. He'd trip people up rather than tackle them. But it was the shorts that stick in my mind more than anything. I have a feeling they were like faded denim blue or something. But he really could find him anywhere on the pitch. It was a hoot. Johnny, I'm a bird. On the sort of rainy days when when football pitches were flooded. Or the sports hall was flooded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we used to go out for cross country runs. People used to hate cross country running, mm. but it was um, a chance to get out, break the monotony of school. You're sort of free for about 10, 15 minutes, and you can go down Greens Lane and or people longer, used to stop and. If you walk. <laughs> and I mean, you used to get the usual smokers going down Greens Lane and lighting up halfway down the <laughs> lane, or uh, people used to run home. Anybody living down here used to go home for a drink or something. It was. <laughs> it was just an excuse to get out of school, I think. I always used to go for cross country, mainly because I lived in the village that the course went through, so I knew all the shortcuts, you see. So <laughs> it'd be five of us who'd walk round the course, but it'd be a lot shorter than the actual one we're supposed to do. But the, 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 because we walked, the amount of time it had taken would be the same as we run round the whole, the whole course. <laughs> What I've noticed today is the fact that the kids are playing more sports and different sports. People were playing badminton today. We didn't even see a, a badminton racket when we were, we were at school. And certainly the, 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 the kids today seem to be doing more sports. I think I was one of the pioneers on the ecology field trips. And that was like lower sixth, I don't know what year it would be, 74? Yes, December 74. It was freezing cold and we went off to Wales. On the first day, they took us on a walk. Now, I'm totally unfit. I'm not into sports. The most I did was swim a little bit. And the first day, they did a really tough walk right up the hills outside of Betsy Court. I think I was the last one to the top. And then we got to the top, and they said, right, you've got to mark out a patch about a metre square, and you've got to identify what's in that metre square. And all we could come up with was heather. Everybody else had loads of different things, and all we could find was heather. Climbing up a mountainside for about a mile and a half to look at some geographical feature like whatever it might be, a boulder, which had been deposited there a million years ago or something. And we climbed all, all the way up the mountainside with Mr Thomas breathing quite heavily. <coughs> and we got to the top, and then I think it was about time to go. So a group of us ran as fast as we could down the hillside, back to the coach, past the coach, and into the pub. <laughs> where we had something like two or three pints in about ten minutes. Jump back onto the coach, the coach was away. And of course, within about 20 minutes, everybody wanted to go to the loo. <laughs> and I think Mr Thomas had twigged what had happened, and he wouldn't stop the coach. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was a very, very painful ride home. <laughs> I want to whip around the church and show you different bits and pieces about the church and introduce you to the service that's going to take place at half past nine. Immediately, We were very impressed this morning in the RE lesson. It only occurred to us after we came out that the teacher never had to check any child at all. The children were just beautifully behaved <laughs> of their own accord. So obviously discipline's very high and it comes from the children, which I think yes. must be a better system. When we did RE, you sat there and you were so frightened of the teacher that you didn't even pick your pencil up until told to do. And the difference today in the style of teaching was incredible. There's a lot more coming from the students um, and the teachers kind of promoting a discussion. The students are more involved in the work. They're actually having to use their brains and think about what they're going to say. Um, whereas before you just sat there and you did get bored. I, mean, mm. I remember most about RE was having to sit and draw lots of sand and burning bushes. I think we were a lot more scared of the teachers than maybe generally they are now. 
I get on very well with Mrs. Parker now, but she used to frighten us to death. If she shouted down the corridor, you did exactly what she said. And if you ever had nail varnish or makeup on, she used to scrub your face. I have memories of Mr. Fox as well. He was a very kind of ex-army type. Some of his punishments were absolutely weird. I mean, he used to... The good ones were when you, he got you going around collecting litter from the school grounds, which was fair enough. But the worst one I came across was giving you a pair of nail scissors, telling you to cut the grass at the front of the school. <laughs> and he'd give you a patch to cut and he'd come and check it afterwards as well. Competition was encouraged. It was very, very intense and... It wasn't just enough to pass your exams. You had to, when I started at the, at the grammar school, you had to come out on top to feel proud of yourself. There were prizes for achievement all the way through school. I remember getting one from the first year. I think it was because they were sorry for me because I was on crutches. Most of us used to be a nervous wreck on exam day. And you could be a very clever person yet do terrible exams. And it's the whole, the whole of your school life wasted on one day. Right, so what, what we want to do today is to uh, introduce a new idea, uh, the displacement time graph. Previously we've talked about uh, velocity time graphs, but I want you to find out for yourself today about... There were six of us in Upper Sixth Science, six girls and about 18 boys, I think. And in physics, that was down to two girls. Mid-70s, it was really like the beginning of the push for women to be involved in a wider range of, uh, of things but it, you didn't just do an air level because you liked doing it you had to convince people that it was going to be useful to you as well because even then jobs were becoming a bit more scarce once you'd made the decision to do sciences you got an awful lot of encouragement and backup to do well in that science and to think about positively about going on to do a, a degree or something in a science subject as girls certainly we did get a lot of encouragement to do science once you'd made the commitment I can always remember some girls going into metal work. I can even remember one boy going into typing because we used to really rib him up about it, but he didn't mind, he just carried on. So that was the advantage of a new school as well. And that was strictly out of bounds when, Definitely. in my time, it, the girls did cookery and sewing, whether they liked it or not, and the boys did woodwork and metal work and never the twain shall meet. Them. That just started when I came here in the third year. So it was just like a new school, a new beginning, new ideas. Sweetness, sweetness, I was only joking when I said I'd like to mash a three food in your Great times, we drink coffee and listen to the Smiths. <laughs> Nineteen eighty eight and a new generation have reached the sixth form at Haslingdon High School. There's always a lot of discussion going on during break in the sixth form. There's a lot of different views being thrown around. In the first year I think many people were rather nervous and wondering whether they were going to be in the top band, middle band, or bottom band. Not very many people mixed. People tend to think that if you're in the top band, you are a snob and, and vice versa. People don't tend to mix. I think it's about time that the school realised that they're not there just to teach you, to pass your exams, to get your O-levels. It's about time they taught you about what's outside. The very fact that we're not taught how to drive a car, how to make love how to, I don't know, just cope with everyday lives. I mean, that, in my view, would be the real knowledge of, of what a school should teach, not the wheat fields of Canada. I think it was in the fourth year that we had lessons called PR, personal relationships. I think that was the closest we ever got. It told you things like drugs, sex, things like that. But the problem was that it was confined to one single lesson a week, and it lasted for one year. And that was the sum total of what was going on in the outside world. It was like the ladybird introduction to real life. Going around the school, I have heard quite a number of racist comments. When I came into the sixth form, I waited for somebody to come and speak to me being worried about 
or they're going to accept me as a nation, or they're not, who do I pick, who do I not? I do feel many of the English aren't aware of how we do actually feel, or else how I feel. I don't think any of you are aware of that. You've got your, your whites, one side of the school, and you've got your Asians playing football on the tennis courts. You don't see much of them. There is a bit of tension between them, call names and everything. But school education is supposed to build you for future life. What I cannot see is that in future, how the two communities are going to mix. If they're not taught to mix at school, there's still going to be the racial tension when they get out of school, when they grow up, when they have families. So it's, it's just never any process. They've got it, something's got to be done so they can mix. Most of my comprehensive life has been here, but I couldn't, I couldn't be the old school Thai traditional person and say, oh yes, Haslingdon High School. I, mean, I just couldn't be part of that. I think I'll be coming back to a very regulated school, a very exam orientated school. It's becoming like a, a business. No matter how ideal we want the school to be, that is what it actually comes down to in the end, the exam results. That's what we've worked for. That's why we're in the sixth one, to get our A-levels. I think one day that will sum up my education is exam results day. And seeing the people's faces as I line up to get the exam results, to see the nervousness, to see the worry about the future. And that is what education today is about, getting your exams. And the very fact that in 30 years' time you can come back to school and say, yes, I am head of ICI and it's all down to you lot. At the end of the fifth year, when a lot of pupils left, I mean, I was in tears and I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's a breaking up of something that has been so permanent. It's very upsetting and having to leave school and I'm not honestly looking forward to it at all. It's sort of the ending of one life and so it's like the beginning of another. Everything that you've done throughout your whole life is finished and you're back at the bottom starting work. School Ties was presented by Jenny Mills and produced at Pebble Mill by Sarah Rowlands.